So this is a story about telling stories. I'll start by acknowledging that I wrote this story in the city of Nam, or Melbourne. And I wrote upon the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the East Coast Nation, the traditional custodians of this land and storytellers whose accounts of living with the land and living with law have been passed down for tens of thousands of years. Uh, we meet this evening on their lands and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, thanks so much to the FECS for generously giving me the space to tell a few stories, to the City of Melbourne for helping make it possible with a quick response arts grant, uh, to my program manager Laura Johnston for being so lovely to work with. Uh, I am deeply grateful to the extraordinarily talented uh, Vidya Rajan for helping me forge this lecture performance into shape and for pulling it together and I'm also grateful to my partner Will Dawson for pulling me together. Um, it's been really nice getting to experiment with the genre of the lecture performance because you know you and if you, you get to have the best of both worlds. So um, lectures for example can be boring um, and performances, performances don't have to make sense. So just kind of bringing these together so we're all together. Uh, and so yeah, great. Okay. So, uh, so this is a story about law, uh, and it's a story about how the law listens to stories. And it's about how the law attempts to translate stories within the medium of law. And it's about how the law attempts to recognize stories as lawful, as legally significant, and how the law can sometimes struggle to do this translation work. But why it might be worth trying anyway. So it's a story about law basically, and I am the storyteller, so without being immodest, who am I? I suppose it's helpful to tell you at the outset that I am the hero of the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's very modest. So, and then I am the best equipped person to tell the story. Um, yeah, so as for my credentials, I am an activist lawyer, uh, I am a theatre practitioner, and I'm also a swift um, <laughs> um, T Swift is actually very relevant to the story. <laughs> Now, we can see. So, anyway, so this activist lawyer finds a way of telling stories about law that is just right. Right? So, nobody does it better than me, as long as we're clear of that. Uh, I'm the best, or like, I'm the second best because the best is obviously me. But we'll go with the second best because at least, at least it was easy getting tickets for this show. I'm the hero of the story, and I think it's important that we don't lose sight of that. Not all heroes wear capes. I guess lawyers do wear ropes, but here is a helpful visual aid that captures the hero's journey. Um, so it starts with hiking, um, <laughs> which actually I have done once, my partner will confirm. Um, and then you have the call to adventure right there, and then you have the beginning of a transformation, and then you have challenges and temptations along the way. There's this abyss right at the bottom, there's a low point, and then there's a more transformative transformation right there. You have a period of atonement, and then you return. So a moment of homecoming where you're back at the start, but you're fundamentally altered. So that's the signposting part of this lecture done. Um, and so that's a good visual aid. And then just a little kind of like visual reminder for the people. <laughs> So, um, all right, so there are a few different points, there are a few different times and places, but perhaps it starts when I'm 13, and perhaps it starts when I decide to take up an advanced middle school class in Sanskrit, famously difficult ancient Indian language, uh, just so that I could be in the same room with a particular classmate, in other words, the first time I fell in love. Um, perhaps uh, it starts when I'm 15 and I realize this thing that I do 
um, this thing that I do when I read books and I watch movies and I change the gender of the protagonists in my mind. And it dawns on me that that's not a thing that most of my peers are doing. Um, perhaps it begins the next year when I co-write a play with a classmate in high school for the first time. Um, and the play ends with our characters embracing tenderly on a stage, doing a thing in the imagined world through the magic of words that we didn't dare to do in the real world. Um, and perhaps it's that sense of the power of words to build worlds, to imagine other realities, and my growing sense that I could do things with words, that I could braid them in ways that I could do things in the world. But the thing with each of these moments, as wonderful or as exciting um, as they were, were that well, each of them was taking place in a shadow. So each of these things was constrained by a shadow that marked the boundaries of my world. So a shadow that constricted the imagination that I had of what was possible. And so perhaps the story really starts by tracing back to the moment from which that shadow was cast. It's pretty far back, so that's we started <laughs> in the 1860s, so more than a hundred years into British colonial rule over India, with the importation of one of the harshest colonial legacies, uh, cricket. <laughs> <laughs> This was not cricket, but I was going to cast a long and very boring shadow over my shadow. <laughs> so, you get it. Anyway, um, it was the year the Indian Penal Code was enacted, bringing with it Section 377. So Section 377, the sodomy law, the provision that criminalized carnal intercourse against the order of nature, effectively criminalizing homosexuality. And for many years, homosexuality was criminalized very effectively. The law was used to persecute. It was used to prosecute hundreds of thousands of queer people in India over the decades. Now, sometimes the law enabled the police to directly arrest and prosecute queer persons for suspected acts of sodomy. More often, more pervasively, it fostered an environment that enabled discrimination and violence. So to grow up queer in India was to grow up living within the specter of this everyday violence. And you could be subjected to that violence without ever actually encountering a cop. Because it was also an imaginative violence that constrained the possibilities of what life could be, of the paths that you could take, and of the lives that you could live. So law was the shadow here. And then you had the people who I saw fight battles against the shadow monster. So, lawyers, right? Uh, now that's the legal team of Lawyers Collective, which is one of India's leading human rights organizations. And in 2001, led by Anand Grover, who was the gentleman right up center, Lawyers Collective made a pretty major move to slay the beast that was Section 377. And they did it through the power of words. So through a petition that was filed before the Delhi High Court arguing that this colonial era law was a violation of the post-colonial constitution of India. So in particular, violating our constitutional rights to equality, non-discrimination, and personal liberty. And so what these lawyers were doing was they were taking these violent words of the law, these words that continued to cast a shadow over us, over our lived reality, all the way from 1860, and they were using these other words, this other vocabulary, also gifted by the law, to challenge the first reality and to imagine a way out of it. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, they were basically like the Taylor Swifts. <laughs> um, again, you laugh, but for example, in Love Story, <laughs> she takes the Romeo and Juliet narrative, which is famously tragic and violent, and then decides that she's just going to rewrite it and imagine a different, happier ending using the magic of songwriting, right? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Anyway, uh, I thought, you know what, this, this is what I want to do. Uh, not songwriting, but this, is, like, this could be me, like, this could be the hero that I uh, am. So in that moment, my, my mission became clear. So I knew that I had to do the heroic feat required of me. So I knew I had to do what really no highly self-confident person in the history of the world who enjoys debating has ever done before. So I had to go to law school. <laughs> and I don't, I don't have anything important to report. That's my point. So I don't have anything important to report for most of my time in law school. So we're on the early threshold part of the hero's journey. So there's a, there's a whole lot of boring grind work at the stage as you kind of learn the ropes. Um, I did, I did. I did well in law school, obviously. <laughs> and so, I mean, who doesn't? But I guess the other 99% will love you too. But, I mean, someone's gonna do. Anyway, so, so did I. <laughs> very modest. So, did I, did, I feature, did I feature on the cover of Forbes magazine for my efforts at creating a queer, inclusive workspace at the organizations I interned? Actually, I did. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, so, so there I was. Um, I was kind of biding my time, um, growing steadily, more excellent at the law, waiting for my turn to slay my law dragons. Um, meanwhile, in the real world, the judicial process was marching along at its own pace. This was 2009, and the petition filed by our friends here is successful. So, as of July the 2nd, 2009, it's no longer criminal to be gay in India, and everyone is very happy um, for one week. Uh, because then this decision is challenged before an appellate court, so the highest court of India, the Supreme Court, by the astrologer, Suresh Kumar Kaushal, along with the Apostolic Churches Alliance, the Hindu Mahasabha, and the All India Muslim Personal Law Board, as all the religious organizations of the country come together in a rare display of communal harmony. <laughs> um, so at this point, the Supreme Court of India is preparing to hear the matter. It's not clear exactly when this will happen. We now jump two years forward to 2011. The court still hasn't heard the matter. I was in my final year of law school, law student by day, Liz Taylor aspirant by night. <laughs> um, and then, in March 2011, in March 2011, I received the email that would change everything. So it was an email from a lawyer. Um, the lawyer was a member of the litigation team that was challenging the validity of the sodomy law before the Supreme Court. So this was the team that had won in 2009, and they were now trying to defend that decision. And so the lawyer was putting together a written submission about the discriminatory impact of the sodomy law within university spaces. And what he wanted um, for me was to see if, if I could just draft an affidavit about my experiences as a gay man, and then it would be based as a submission before the court. So that's the email that I received. Um, but that's not necessarily the email that I read. So how I read the email was... Um, and so this is what heroes do, right? So we, I said I will rise to the challenge. I will do this. I will do this deed for you. For us, for all of us. <laughs> I will write this affidavit. Um, now, had I drafted an affidavit before? No. Um, because that would have made my law degree useful, and skills were not a thing that the National Academy of Legal Studies and Research necessarily emphasized. Um, <laughs> did I know what an affidavit was? Yes. I knew the definition. Um, I knew the theory behind it. 
and that's really all you need to do things. Um, so I knew that an affidavit is a written statement made under an oath. Um, through the affidavit, you provide a certain account of something, and you swear that it is true. But, as the person on whose capable shoulders the fate of the Indian queer movement lay, I also felt like the affidavit could be a bit more than that. Um, maybe I could think of the affidavit as a mode of relating my story before a court of law. So maybe the affidavit could be a bridge. A bridge between the law as it is written and the law as it is lived. And it was my job to build that bridge with my words, to show the judges, beyond reasonable doubt, what it meant to live for the shadow of the sodomy law and in the process solve the big gay problem. <laughs> um, and you know who's really good at writing bridges? <laughs> <laughs> for example, <laughs> Take the song up story. So this is a song where um, Taylor is riffing off Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And the first two thirds of the song is pretty much her retelling the story that we know with a really snappy hook. So we have their first meeting, we have the balcony scene, we have their families feuding, and then we know where the story is going and we resign ourselves to it. Then we come to the bridge of the song. And in the bridge, the song slows down. So the two lovers meet at the outskirts of town. Juliet is anguished. Um, I can't go on, she says. It's still all kind of familiar. And then suddenly the song speeds up. And as it speeds up, the bridge starts to depart from the story that we know. So, so she's using this part to take us to a different reality. And then there's a key change, and now the bridge has taken us. <laughs> and it turns out, it turns out that this story is now going to have a different ending. Because in this version of the story, Romeo has managed to have a civil chat with a senior captain, <laughs> and everything's going to be just fine. It's a love story, maybe just say yes. Um, and so, just like that, Taylor Swift rewrites Shakespeare. As a side note, this lecture was originally titled. Um, <laughs> spent the next few weeks pouring my heart and my soul into this little document, forging a story that jumped back to my years growing up as an Indian expatriate in the Middle East, through to my first heart-stopping coming out experience, to the day I wore a rainbow sweater in a law school classroom. If these lawyers wanted a story, I would give them drama. <laughs> so, so when my, when my masterpiece is complete, I mail it to the lawyer. So this is, this is going to be my moment. Like, I, I, can, I can feel it. Um, and so he sent his edits back to me a week later with uh, this email. had been sliced and diced. And as I read it over and over in utter disbelief, um, all I could think was, you know, how could I, two-time gold medalist in law school, 500-time <laughs> listener of love story, <laughs> how could I have gotten this so wrong? The, the law, legal language, words, that had been my thing. So how could I be using legal language incorrectly? So he said, 
you know how legal language is, and I thought, didn't I? <laughs> a year goes by, it's 2012, the year after the lawyer butchered my literary style, the Supreme Court of India began to hear the final arguments in this matter. At this point, I had graduated from law school and I had snuck into the litigation team for this case, the affidavit that I had drafted, the one which the lawyer had butchered, obviously did not make it before the court. But that's fine, because I was doing arguably the most important task in the litigation, which was to carry the case files to the courtroom. <laughs> so, so while the affidavit that I had drafted did not make it before the court, another affidavit and it was an affidavit written by a transgender woman called Kokila, who identified as a member of the Hijra community. So I want to take you inside the courtroom to the day that this affidavit was read out. So it's an important day, it's, it's an important moment. And it comes about four weeks into a six week hearing. What does it feel like in the courtroom? There is a suffocating stillness mixed with the anxious hope of a room full of lawyers. So many of us queer, not that the judges knew or cared. It smells of old paper, so much paper. Sheets of legal documents flying about, passed over from counsel, documents that contain case law and legislation, and argument briefs and affidavits. And right up front in the room are the judges. And you are high on a pedestal. Literally a pedestal that towers above us. Because that's the law, that's your law. Your law that you rain down. And here he stands before these judges, these honorable lordships, the lawyer representing millions of queer persons, standing before the court in the matter of Suresh Kumar Kaushal versus Nas Foundation. Your lordship, this is the matter that affects the lives of millions of citizens in this country. We argue that Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code is unconstitutional, that it criminalizes the intimate lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals in the country, that it exposes them to harassment, blackmail, persecution, and prosecution. We place before you, Your Lordships, a number of documents and affidavits to show that there is widespread abuse of the section, which leads to harassment faced by LGBTQ individuals. Yes, Your Lordship, whoever has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with man, woman, or animal shall be punished with imprisonment for a term. They aren't explicitly mentioned, Your Lordship, but we have overwhelming evidence to show over the past 150 years that it is LGBT persons who have been targeted under this law. Your Lordships, I am telling you that this was the intent of the law and that these are the people who the law was originally created to persecute. By looking at the origin of the law, by looking at how it has made its way into the Indian Penal Code. Your Lordships, if we go back in time, the first recorded mention of sodomy in English law was in two medieval texts that prescribed that sodomite should be burnt alive. Then, when secular laws began to come into place in England, you had the Buggery Act in the 16th century. In the Supreme Court, Your Lordships. We're on Tilak Mark. India. Your Lordships, we are in India. <laughs> no, Your Lordships, there is, uh, there is no doubt that we are in India, but if you will permit me, I would like to read out an affidavit to you which tells you about the impact of this law. So this is an affidavit by Kokila, a Hijra woman from Bangalore, and it has been admitted into the court record. <clears throat> my name is Kokala. I identify myself as a hijra, that is a member of a traditional male to female transsexual community in South Asia. Right from my childhood, I felt that I was a girl and I liked to dress in girls' clothes, cook, and put makeup. On the 18th June 2004, 
around 8 p.m. While I was walking on the road, dressed in women's clothing, I was raped by 10 men. They forcefully took me to the grounds next to Old Madras Road. They threatened to kill me. If I wouldn't have sex with them, I was forced to have oral and anal sex with all of them. While I was being sexually assaulted, two policemen arrived and the men ran away. I told the police about the sexual assault by the Gunda. Instead of registering a case against the Gunda and sending me for medical examination, they took me along with the two captured Gundas to the Bhai police station. The police did not even allow me to put on my trousers. I was forced to be naked for the next seven hours. I was stripped naked, my hands handcuffed to a window. They hit me with their lattice. They kicked me with their feet. They abused me using sexually violent language. They burnt my nipples with a burning choir rope. Your Lordship, as mentioned, I'm reading from an affidavit made under oath on penalty of perjury. There are multiple newspaper accounts and fact-finding reports which I can produce before you corroborating the events that Kokala describes. As you can see, Your Lordship, Section 377 creates a situation where these abuses can happen. It legitimizes this behavior. exchange and over and over trying to trying to make sense trying to understand why they wouldn't listen so I've read that affidavit over and over how it opens with Kokila telling us she is a daughter um, telling us her age her address and details about her workplace eight numbered paragraphs follow this preamble Six of these paragraphs are devoted to telling the story of her brutal rape and torture. Each of these paragraphs were read out before the court in full graphic detail. And when the lawyer finished, the judges hesitated for a few seconds and then that question, that one question. How do we know this happened? What is the veracity of this claim? How do we know she isn't lying? How do we take her to her word? The judges had heard this narrative, but they hadn't listened. As it turns out, the court did not take her at her word. So in 2013, the Supreme Court of India delivered its verdict on the constitutional validity of the sodomy law, and it found that LGBT persons constituted a minuscule minority, so too small to warrant a change in the legal framework of the country. The judge went on to note that the sodomy law did not violate the so-called rights of LGBT persons, in their words. Um, so I took this very personally. It was uh, one thing to read those words as a queer person, but it was another to read those words as a queer lawyer. right? So as someone who had a sense of attachment to the possibilities of the law. And one way of dealing with the situation is to say, oh well, the judges were clearly never going to listen, they were simply too rooted in their prejudice, but that didn't seem enough. So that felt like an abdication of our responsibility, because sure, while I was angry with the judges, I was furious with the lawyers. So I'd been told a year ago that, that my version of legal language was not right, that I was too literary. And now, the lawyers had used a highly pointed, non-literary form of legal language and still not gotten anywhere. So surely we had a responsibility as translators of the law, as people who were attempting to translate life into law for the judges 
Surely it was up to us to try and push at the bounds of legal language and try and get the judges to listen. See, here I am, angry with the judges, furious with the lawyers, despondent about the law, which didn't really seem to hold anything for me at this point. So I was having a moment of crisis. And I wasn't the only one having a moment of crisis. Taylor Swift <laughs> found that the tide of public opinion had turned against her. So we don't have to go into the grim details of exactly what happened. <laughs> So the crisis led to her entering her reputation era, and this meant experimenting with rap. <laughs> um, and then for a brief period, she exclusively used snake emojis to communicate. Uh, so, um, so <laughs> look, it was a rough time, right? But she, did, she did what she had to do in the process. Um, in my case, dealing with my own crisis, um, I also entered my reputation era. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> I turned away from the world, or what had at least been my world so far. So I turned away from the law. Um, and I did something, I did something that, that no young gay man who has had a lot of emotions to process has ever done in history. <laughs> I became a playwright. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote a play, uh, and the play was titled Contempt. Uh, that was a restaging of this very Supreme Court trial that led to the recriminalization of homosexuality. So, along with writing about the exchanges between the lawyers and the judges, I decided to play around with an element of litigation that had bothered me for a while. So I decided to try and reimagine the affidavit. Now I told you earlier about how I understood the affidavit to be a bridge between the law as it is written and the law as it is lived. So it's the mode through which we might translate life into law and make a life legible before the courtroom. So 2011, while rejecting my literary affidavit, the lawyer had said, you know how legal language is the legal language that he knew, and the one that I was supposed to know, was a language that had to be piercingly direct. Right? So what this meant for him, and what this meant for the other lawyers, was telling Kokila's story through six numbered paragraphs that tell you about a brutal sexual assault with no room and no space to tell you about the person behind the story. So the messy shape of a life reduced to this forensic account of violence. And I wondered, well, maybe if you leech life out of law, you also make the person testifying before the court illegible to the judge. And if that's the case, how do you make this person legible? How do you give this person a shape? So the lawyer was telling me, I couldn't digress from the point the point being how a person was harmed by the law, but perhaps the point is lost without the digressions. So, with the resources of the theatrical imagination, what could I do here? Right? So I wanted to find a way of telling Kokila's story that would, that would allow her to exist as more than the sum total of an astonishing act of violence that would find a way of bringing out something gentler, something more quotidian. A way of doing the affidavit differently, to theatrically explore what legal practice could also be, and about what it might also mean to be recognized as a person before the law. And so my play, Contempt, has this scene where the lawyer reads out Kokila's affidavit. But then the scene is broken by Kokila, who walks into the courtroom space and who starts telling us a different kind of story. And this is not a story restricted to um, that one horrific incident, but it is a narrative 
It's a narrative that speculates about how she might have chosen her name and about what intimacy might mean for her. Kokala is my name. When I ask them to write it in black ink on green paper with a blue stamp, they look at me like I've come to the wrong place. You know, but there is one document that calls me Kokala. There is one place where you will say it. It is that document that allows me to say who I am, that I exist. It is an affidavit. It speaks about my rape. My name is Kokala. If you repeat a word enough times, it might lose its meaning. I still very much like you to say my name. So across the first few months of 2018, I performed contempt in a range of venues, largely law schools. Because I was presenting an argument that was essentially about legal practice, I wanted to make it before future practitioners of the law. So for me, the play and the manner in which I was staging it was very much about a practice of the law. Right? So it was about paying attention to language, so I maintained the word as my focal point, and the staging was very sparse, um, as in, in the scene when Kokila appears before the court, and the focus is on the content of Kokila's words, so it's on the text of the affidavit. So I was telling a story about how the law could be told differently and about how legal language could be uttered in different registers. So it was important that the bridge that I was constructing to another reality be tethered in something that looked recognizably like law. Uh, so was this successful? Did it directly lead to sweeping transformative change across legal practice in India, ultimately leading to the overturning of the sodomy law? Who's to say? Well, not law. <laughs> <laughs> but, there are things that I can say with confidence. So I can tell you, I can tell you that the play drew a number of lawyers and judges to its various shows. Um, I can tell you that it generated a degree of excitement across law schools in the country. I can tell you that it stimulated conversations about how practitioners of the law could do legal language differently. Uh, so it's 2018. 2018 and things are looking good, the play is definitely generating the kinds of conversations I hoped it would. There's every possibility it could take off even further, that it could create more dialogue, that it could save legal language. Um, and then, an unexpected thing happened. A theatre collective decided to reinterpret my play. So, the group was called the Oddbird Collective and they had highly respectable credentials in the theatre world. So they came across my script a few months after it had started being performed, and the thing that really excited them about this work was that it had all these stories about queer lives in India that hadn't been told, which they 
for, you know, maybe this sort of a larger audience. And I thought, that's, that's great. You know, this, this really meant that the play would get a bigger platform and the conversations that I was hoping to generate would be that much more widespread. So that's great. Except that their creative process involved reinterpreting large elements of the play. And one of the big changes that they made was that they really de-emphasized the text. So in the scene with Kokila, for example, they create this tableau where you have a set of muslin frames and you have Kokila seated within them and you have images of the city at night projected onto the screens. The actor on stage does not speak. You can hear a recorded affidavit playing in the background, but it's interspersed with all these other sounds of the night. So there's quite a few words that are hard to discern. And even when you do discern them, your attention was kind of directed elsewhere. So I saw this and I thought, oh, that's that's really pretty, I guess, but it's not it's not giving love. <laughs> you know, so, so doesn't this departure from the world of the courtroom, doesn't this entry into a world of more abstract imagery, like didn't it mean that the initial idea that I had of how we could tell a story within a courtroom, wasn't that kind of diluted? Like the affidavit was now unlatched from a courtroom, the actual words of the law were missing, so what is the play saying now? What's the law question here? Um, and I had that sense of ambivalence extending to other staging choices that they made as well. So. With the trial scenes and contempt, instead of staging the show such that the lawyer kind of faces the judges, like in a regular courtroom, which is what my script did, the Orbit Collective did this thing where they placed the lawyer in a corridor with the judges on either ends of the corridor, so that the lawyer is kind of constantly shifting to and fro, um, trying to respond to the judges. And you know, it's it's cool. Like there's this really great velocity that builds up in the process. And I watched them and I thought, great, but hold on, that's not what it feels like to be in a courtroom. A real courtroom is so much more static, right? So no one's dancing around except for the frazzled intern trying to get you the correct case all the time. Uh, and so what were they saying? Like, what, what were they trying to do? And I was really trying to be reasonable about this um, because I've learned reasonableness. Um, and, so, and so I appreciated what they were doing like, I thought it was beautiful, I thought it was heartfelt, and I'm sure that people would feel something, but also feelings weren't the point because the <laughs> argument that I was making about law, about how we could speak law differently, had gotten so diluted here. So I wanted to be generous to their take, but then because I had legal training, I knew that there are things that you just cannot do with legal language or it just won't make sense anymore. And you know, this feels like such an important insight. So I started writing it down. Um, and this could be a really interesting paper, right? Like 10 people could read it. Um, <laughs> and I seem to have arrived at this Goldilocks moment, you know, how much we can push legal language. So, so not too much and not too little. And it's important to challenge it, but don't bend it out of shape so it's unrecognizable. And the thoughts kind of just pour out, so yeah, there's this balance that you have to strike, this balance, you know, like, what the order collector was doing with their immaculate staging was very pretty, but it was not law. And you know how legal language is, right? You know how legal language is. I'm really, I'm so sorry to have to critique your emotionally charged work, but you know how legal language is. And as I'm writing these words, I realize where I've seen them before. I realize who I've become at this moment. <laughs> so, I realized that <laughs> the hero had become the anti-hero. Uh, please appreciate the idea of a villainous condition. <laughs> so, how did I get to this point? Right? I with my beliefs in the magic of words and the legal imagination. I, who had literally written a play as a response to another lawyer's perceived lack of legal imagination. So he was the one 
who was leeching life out of law. Like he was the one who refused to reimagine law's language, who folded willingly to its formal constraints. I was the one who had argued that we needed to tell these laws and stories differently. That was me. But then, here I was, telling these other theater practitioners that their way of telling was too detached from law. So, in fiercely holding on to my particular vision of law's language, I was missing the possibilities that they were unfolding. How had I become this person? And how could I try and not be this person? So I needed to do something. I, I needed to do something that would break me apart and hopefully build me up again. And something that would be a true act of atonement. And if you're following along, we're now at the atonement stage <laughs> of the hero or of the anti-hero's journey. And so I said, okay, if you want atonement, I'm going to do perhaps the most extremely masochistic act known to mankind. I'm going to do a punishment of the highest degree, a punishment that would lead to the highest degree. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I decided to do a PhD. <laughs> um, flash forward, 2020. I'm living my best graduate student life in Melbourne. <clears throat> I queue up for the croissants at my club, I get my auction room flat whites, I have my 5k loops mapped out, I'm dealing with the big global phenomenon that's affecting all of us, Taylor's folklore album. <laughs> uh, <laughs> year into my PhD, and I'm still, I'm still trying, I'm trying to think through what legal language is. Um, it helps that I'm now tutoring in a course that's literally called legal language at the Melbourne Law School. So this is what Associate Professor Peter Rush, who teaches this course at the Melbourne Law School, has to tell us about legal language. So Rush's point here is that law is an activity, and it's an activity that's conducted through a range of languages. His point is that legal language is plural, so you can never really hold it down. Now, James Boyd White, who is one of the founding practitioners of the discipline called Law and Literature, tells us that legal language is an exercise in translation and retranslation. So, what does he mean by that? So, a client approaches a lawyer and narrates a series of facts. The lawyer translates this into a story. It's a legally legible story that the judge can then understand. The judge and the lawyer engage in a conversation using the lexicon of the law. The lawyer then takes that exchange and retranslates it back to the client. So those of us who consider ourselves practitioners of the law have to constantly do this kind of translation work, going back and forth between the languages of law and the languages of other disciplines and communities. And you can't really pin this language down. It's part of the point. The law, says White White, is constantly recast. It's constantly created and recreated by judges and lawyers in the way in which they think and argue. So we take a step back. My lawyer friend, who butchered my literary style, says, look, if you want to be heard by law, if you want to be heard by the judge, speak the language of law. And then here's J.B. White saying, actually, you create law's language each time you think and argue. So maybe it can shift. Maybe it sort of always has to shift. And maybe it's our responsibility to shift it. Maybe it's something that we always have to do. But who is the we here? Who gets to take the responsibility of doing this thing, this task of shifting? Whose voice is accorded the authority of law? And whose voice gets dismissed as something that's extraneous to law? So as I think about these questions as my brain turns steadily to mush as I do my atonement, um, and 
you know, kind of thinking through them, and you know, if there's anything that can really truly humble a person and that can strip away all notions of the self as a heroic figure, um, it is sitting in your supervisor's office and watching them microscopically pour over your latest draft chapter with a mixture of pity and confusion. Um, and they ask you, so what is your method here? <laughs> and then you respond, oh, I read books. <laughs> and then there's a silence, there's a very long silence, and then you continue. You know, it's not it's not theory, but it's not not theory. <laughs> and then there's even more silence, the longest silence in your life, and you're just kind of going on, so you go, you know, I guess you can say that I co-produced my thoughts and conversation with Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, this is not the right answer. I'm a supervisor. So it turns out that you need to do a bit more than that for your PhD. So I, I did the things. I read, I wrote, I walked, I folklored, I, you know, brins repeat the cycle, trying to find answers, except that I wasn't sure what the question was. I want to say that there was a moment of piercing insight, where I solved the meaning of law, <laughs> where I figured out how to do law well, but it rarely works like that. Um, instead, it's more like a series of dawning realizations, except each time an idea coheres, you have to rework it, because you've now understood just a bit more, just enough to make that idea that much more obsolete. And so it becomes this constant sense of reaching for something that's just beyond your grasp, just at the limits of your imagination. And in these iterative circles of thinking, I found myself returning to a recording that I had of the Orbit Collective show. And each time I returned to it, I found myself catching a detail that I had missed. So one time, I noted how the muslin frames placed around the lawyer would gradually fold in upon him as the hearings progressed. The weight of law quite literally sucking the air around him. Another time, I rewatched the scene with Kokila's affidavit, and I noted how the image that was projected on her was a yellow traffic barricade. And I recognized it for what it was, an everyday symbol of police violence. So I watched, and I watched again. And the next time I watched, I heard sounds of the night. I heard an oral scape of crickets, of distant car engines, of feet against gravel, and I heard Coppola's voice and her alternate testimony on this recorded track. And this time I heard how her words were punctuated by those other recorded sounds. And I heard and I watched again and again. And the next time, the next time I saw Coppola's single-handed focus on stage, binding an intricate anklet around her foot, I saw Coppola, all of her, refusing to be flattened into a singular narrative of loss, refusing to be flattened into a singular identity, challenging us to hold on to all the different lives that she lives. The audio recording of her affidavit continued, I heard about the violence that she was subject to, but I also watched her body display a joyous defiance. So here was a vision of legal language that could speak beyond text that could communicate through sound and image and gesture. It was a legal language that didn't play by the rules that I was familiar with. So slowly, I began to notice things that I'd been missing out before. And I'd been missing these things, I'd been missing these things because I hadn't been listening. Or rather, I'd missed these things because I'd been listening for a certain something. I'd been listening for a certain something that I knew to be law. And so, when I was faced with a thing that didn't slot within my preconceived notions of law, it slipped through the cracks of my cognition. To recognize the story as a story of law, I had to be a good translator. To be a good translator, I had to listen, but listening is hard when it's unclear what you are listening for, 
listening is hard when it's unclear what you are listening to. Translating is difficult when you are trying to translate from the unfamiliar. To be a good translator, to recognize law, I had to listen, and I had to listen without always knowing what I was listening for. So I had to listen with an openness and with a sense of vulnerability. And it was a vulnerability that had once come to me intuitively and that I had to now return to, to practice. It was the vulnerability of my 15-year-old self, the version of me that read books and watched movies and changed the gender of the protagonist in my mind. I'd been doing miniature acts of translation then too. I'd been taking the objects of a culture that was designed to not sustain me, and I'd been finding something within those objects anyway, something that would allow me to go on, this fierce sense of love and vulnerability that transformed them for me. But being vulnerable in this manner is hard. It's the hardest thing. So where does that leave us? I, I really wanted to leave you with a neat encapsulation of this journey, like a clear, definitive statement that we might walk out of the room with. But the more I thought about that, the more it felt like it would be untrue to the journey I had. Because that would draw just another clear line, it would give you just another definition, it would mark something finite yet again, and yet I do recognize that we have to end somewhere. <laughs> so, I thought I'd end with another story. In a few seconds from now, I will invite you to open the envelopes that you found as you entered the room, in a few seconds. And I just want to orient you towards what you will find in there. So what you'll find um, is a contract. It is an agreement between two women, Mamta and Mona Lisa, an agreement that was signed on the 6th of October 1998 in a small town in the state of Odisha in India. The women had been lovers for years, and this is a contract that they drafted to form an economic partnership, but then also to remain life partners. I'll now give you a minute to just have a glass of this document. So, how to read this document? So one way that you could read it is to approach it from the perspective of what we call legal doctrine. And if you did that, um, as I have done in the past, you would ask, is this contract valid? The answer at that moment in time would be in the negative. Homosexuality was a criminal offence in 1998 in India at the point that this contract was drafted, which means that the object of the contract, the formation of a life partnership, was unlawful. Contracts with an unlawful object are considered void under the Indian Contract Act. In other words, the contract fails. That is certainly one way in which a past version of me would have read this document. Um, how else to read this contract? We might contextualize it. So we might ask, well, as an instrument, did it enable Mamta and Mona Lisa to assert their independence from their families? The answer to that is also no. This contract was drafted on the 6th of October 1998. On the 10th of October, four days later, 
Mamta and Mona Lisa attempted to commit suicide. Mamta survived. Mona Lisa did not. So the contract failed. It failed at the level of validity and it failed at the level of instrumental benefit. And that's another way in which a past version of me would read it. And I would have said, it doesn't have a story of law to give us. It's at best a story that proves the violence of the sodomy law. It's a story of a misguided attempt to escape the shadow of the sodomy law only to fail. But that's not the story that I want to hold on to. That story is too easy. That story is the reality that I know. The fact that the law cast a shadow that ultimately made it impossible for these women to live together and to live at all, that is a story that I know all too well. A story that joins many, many accounts of people who attempted to live in the shadow of the sodomy law in India and failed. The story of Srinivas Siras, the professor at the Alagar Muslim University who died alone in his room. The story of Sopran Sucheta, the two women lovers whose bodies were found with a white cloth tied around their waist. The story of Kokila, the trans woman who was brutally raped and tortured in a police station. These were the stories that I grew up hearing, that other queer people around me grew up hearing. And if I was to read the contract through these frames, I would once again miss out on the story that Mamta and Monalisa were telling her. Yes, the sodomy law cast a shadow that made it hard for them to live. But then, this document also tells us about their belief in the possibilities of law. It stands as an act of dissent against the sodomy law, and it stands as an attempt to use the form of the contract to give shape to a relationship and to imagine another life together. And so, if I try and put aside my skepticism about the law, and if I try and listen to this document, really listen, if I try and find the world that it imagines, what would that look like? Perhaps we might look at its title. So it's a deed of agreement for partnership as well as to remain life partner. And we might see the double play that is performed here. So the two different kinds of relationships that it formalizes. And you might note that the term life partner had no statutory recognition at that time in 1998, and would not for another two decades. And yet there it is, printed and stamped on an official document, an imagined legal reality hiding in plain bureaucratic sight. And we might glance further down to the nature of the deed, which tells us that it is a partnership to live together to earn livelihood. And we might note the irony here, because the nature of the deed is actually very much unnatural. So the sodomy statute that Mamta and Olisa descend from criminalizes carnal intercourse against the order of nature. And yet here they are, forming a partnership to live together. The contract, this final concrete world they imagine jointly, where they are allowed to set the terms of how they might live together. And then we might glance through its clauses numbered one through six and note that in this melding together of love and commerce, the commercial element is strikingly weak. So clause one, live together by means of any means. Um, clause four, invest the capital contribution in some sort of cottage industry. And that vagueness, that vagueness is a marked contrast to the specificity with which they describe the emotive elements of their partnership in the later clauses. And we might even note that clause six takes up language from the common law relating to contracts. So the language of fraud and of coercion and of misrepresentation. And it repurposes it to guide how these two women might emotionally live together and how they might live together with law. And so a document where law gives legal form to love pleasure for us in sitting through this performance is that 
we a number of us have been on this journey with you. So for a, a, a lot of the biographical context, at least in the last four, four years, three, four years, is very intimate, very closely felt by us as well. Um, and as I also noted last night, I think what we're celebrating tonight is not just this fantastic new work that you're sharing with us, but a trifecta of things that go together beautifully. The completion of a PhD, the securing of a new job in which you're, you're going to be teaching these, these, these fantastically creative approaches to, to the law and, and to thinking laterally and in, in new ways about using the law and um, uh, your students going to be so fortunate to have you as someone who's helping them to think about how to think critically and creatively rather than what to think. So thank you so much. We, we, we celebrate you and please all stay on and, and share some wine and conversation with